There is no single piece of music that is able to transport me back in time, remind me of home and growing up, making me feel like a kid again more than this. This opening cascade of piano notes that follows a quietly increasing string is the sound of my childhood. The title screen to Ocarina of Time is so iconic to so many people in a way that is nearly indescribable. It just hits. The notes don't kick in immediately. Instead, the silence is first broken by the sound of opponents' hooves galloping on hard dirt. Most title screens at the time were about selling what you're about to experience to the player. A loud bright frame or action heavy sequence all meant to overwhelm the player in an attempt to keep their attention, and show off just how cool the following hours will be. Ocarina of Time was different. It's slow. It's calm. It's serene. You could make the argument that The Legend of Zelda at this point had built a certain level of prestige among fans, and an instant hook isn't necessary. But I think that's missing the bigger point. The Zelda franchise has a very specific goal when it comes to music in mind, and this title screen is a perfect reflection of that. And it's the reason there is nothing else that sounds like a Zelda game. Nintendo has mastered the art of scoring their franchises in a way that feels distinct to each individual property while retaining an overall feeling that says, this is still a Nintendo game. Even within their own franchises, the music can twist and evolve as the series themselves do. And for the most part, the musical progression between each game feels as natural as the mechanical evolution. From Mario's more pop music styles to Metro Prime's space influence ambient electronics, every game has its own feel to it, but no game within Nintendo's catalogue demonstrates this more than The Legend of Zelda. The range of music is vast and versatile, and as a result of that, many people can point to two different songs and say that one is their favourite, and you'd be hard pressed to find two people who agree on the subject. Series composer Koji Kondo is undoubtedly a legend within the industry, and his influence from all games he's scored can be felt across the medium. But there is something about the work he has done on Zelda that feels different, and that legacy has lived on in even the games he had no part in scoring. So what is it exactly that makes the Zelda series feel so unique? On a more tangible level, there are a ton of things that people can point to and say, this is what makes a Zelda game a Zelda game. And those things can range from dungeons to its heavy reliance on themes for storytelling, and even its sense of exploration. But honestly, those are easy to replicate. While the results may vary from title to title, you can point to a game like Tunic and say, it's a Zelda clone, and you would understand right away what that person means. However, it doesn't feel like a Zelda game, despite having a lot of the trappings that you would expect from one, and I am willing to bet a lot of that intangible feeling comes from the music. One of my favorite Koji Kondo quotes of all time is how he set out to write music for the original Legend of Zelda on the NES in 1986. With Mario, the music is inspired by the game controls, and its purpose is to heighten the feeling of how the game controls. With Zelda, I was trying to enhance the atmosphere of the environments and locations. The sound of Mario is kind of like popular music, and Zelda is like a kind of music you've never heard before. So I try to incorporate many different types of music to create an otherworldly feel. An otherworldly feel is a concept that has remained since that first title. And while the series has what you could call, for lack of a better word, more traditional music, it still has those moments of otherworldliness that is especially prominent in dungeons, and that to me is the unreplicatable feeling Zelda clones miss, and it makes sense. Creating a style of music that people haven't heard before isn't an easy task. How do you copy an unknown? How does music that is so unfamiliar create such an intense connection with its audience? Let's go back to that title screen for a moment. One of the reasons people play video games is escapism, a way to get lost in another world and take some time away from your own for however long you need or can. The title screen is the last barrier that needs to be crossed before entering a world. It should prime you ready to go, and that's something Koji Kondo understood perfectly when composing this piece. It's not otherworldly, not yet. It has those hints, but it lulls you into a sense of what's to come, or if you're returning, it has become familiar, comforting like a second home. Almost all of the Zelda title screens do this in some way or another. 
They manage to capture the tone of its game in a way that makes you feel like you are returning to a place to see the next incantation of Link and explore the world of most likely Hyrule with him. From Majora's Mask's cheery, hopeful plucking of strings that turns around right at the end, reflecting how the citizens feel about the world versus how it actually is, to Skyward Sword's more filled out orchestral rendition of an old classic fairy fountain, symbolic of Fee and her forthcoming adventure with the hero clad in green. When it comes to accompanying a game with music, not only does its tone need to be matched, it also needs to elevate the experience in its own way. It's the reason a soundtrack like Outer Wilds for example is so beloved. You can't really have one without the other after they've been paired and experienced together. Listening to a song from a game or really any medium should bring you back to that exact moment it was there to serve. The reason Zelda music is so iconic is because Koji Kondo leaned into this idea. Instead of creating music to act as something that sat in the background as players adventured through Hyrule, he instead opted for that otherworldly feeling, to go along with something that's almost tangible in a way. The atmosphere. Something you can feel, but cannot really explain. That otherworldly feeling might feel like the Metroid soundtrack to some if you were to say it outright, but here it's not that. It's not off-planet otherworldly. It's more that the songs become a vibe, an instance where the walls and inhabitants are talking in song creating a backing track to your adventure rather than conventional instruments you would find that usually make up an OST. So with that we've broken up Zelda songs into two main subcategories. Those more traditional songs, the ones you'd hear in an open field or open waters as Link adventures forth to New Horizons. These are more familiar and even if you'd never heard them before, they place a sense of comfort on a player that says it's okay to go forth and seek new things, it's what you are meant to be doing. It helps keeps a sense of grounding within the world. The other is that one that's a little harder to grasp. These are generally used within the dungeons, the unknown and unexplored. A sense of unknowing and sometimes dread lingering and looming over players to help build a tense atmosphere that asks if you should be where you are. While dungeon music in most cases isn't inviting, it also manages to not be off-putting. Instead it feels almost agnostic to the existence of Link, an extension of a temple you're exploring, rather than some instruments played to imitate its stature, allowing room for questioning but also giving space for answers. The low hum of the wind in Arbiter's Ground or the sterile mechanisms of Breath of the Wild Shrines feel like they have been playing long before you arrived and will continue after you leave. It is not always clear if the tracks are actually diegetic or not, but it always feels as if Link is hearing exactly what the player is hearing. Every dungeon past the original NES titles, which had the unfortunate lack of memory for more than a few songs and variations, have their own distinct feel and have carefully mimicked what it would sound like if the walls could sing. You know you're in the forest temple in Ocarina because the instrumentation sounds like wood imps crying down the corridors. And the Tower of the Gods feels as powerful as its name implies because bells ring out loud and long while a choir vocalizes the hymn as a respect. The presence of otherworldly forces is felt through the music as Link must explore and solve puzzles. It's why a battle with an enemy, mini boss, or big boss theme feels jarring. It's out of place, an invasive presence somewhere it shouldn't be, coming in with harsh strings before hitting its melody, a way to catch you off guard before launching an attack. A sharp juxtaposition that snaps you out of the exploration to remind you what's really at stake within the world. This is why Skyward Sword's dungeon music feels less celebrated than the rest of the series. While interesting in its own right, without the vision of Koji Kondo, the tracks feel a little more traditional than its predecessors. There's distinct melody and instrumentation that's easy for most people to pick out and pin down as a way to familiarize themselves with their surroundings and feel comfortable rather than out of place. This isn't a bad approach, it's just not the Zelda approach. And I suspect this was many of the reasons people didn't connect to it in the same way. Honestly, Kondo's departure from the series might have something to do with this, however the other explanation I have thought about since the game's release is the fact it is the first game in series history to use a full orchestra with live instruments for a majority of its music. With regards to Twilight Princess, Kondo reveals he wanted to use an orchestra, but ultimately due to a lack of time to pull it off, withdrew that decision. What's interesting though is he wanted a string section for lyrical moments of the game, and that is something that feels like it carried over into Skyward Sword despite having a new composer. 
Zelda has never had spoken dialogue at this point, but it didn't need it. The music replaced the emotion of words with songs, and it led to some truly memorable moments. Any fan of the series can tell you it doesn't lack any emotional weight. Part of that is the emotional resonance that the series can hold in its songs, whether it's hearing the chords on Zelda's lullaby played on a harp as if it was the first time it was ever played and then passed down from the world of Skyward Sword to Ocarina, or Epona's song lasting through multiple generations. There is nothing like waiting for an old favourite to appear again somewhere along a new journey. However, it's not just old songs that can have this effect. Midna's Lament is one of the most devastating songs in the entire series. Midna's regular theme is slow. It hesitates in the same way Link does with his new companion. But when it comes to her life on the line, that melody is sped up and desperate, moving from a wind instrument to a piano that can convey more range of emotion. And for as much hate as Fee might get in Skyward Sword, her farewell theme, the accumulation of all her moments coming to a head in one final goodbye, is maybe the most tear-jerking moment in the franchise. And it's for a character you probably grew to despise, but the music can just carry so much emotional weight, it's hard not to feel a little bit sad as the flute plays her melody one last time. This is where Skyward Sword succeeds the most in creating an almost cinematic soundtrack that perfectly scores the most heartfelt moments of the game. In a way, it almost feels like a conclusion and celebration of all that came before it, using that orchestra and live instruments to almost sell your performance of old favourites. It may be the first game in the canon, but it feels like the last act of its musical. And so, if Skyward Sword is the conclusion of Zelda music, Breath of the Wild is the aftermath. The Hyrule we find in Breath of the Wild has long since broken, it's barely rebuilding, and it's what makes the soundtrack feel so haunting. It's a different approach to the typical formula of audio because the game is a different approach to its mechanics, neither one managing to forget their roots, but rather they embrace them in an unconventional way. You will find familiar landmarks and hear an old melody, but it's not what it once was. It's broken, like this land. Finding a fairy fountain is met with a familiar, but now desperate plea. Like Clock Town on day three, it has a second more ominous low melody that is almost begging Link to flee, while its high notes cry for his help. The two almost clash with each other as their notes play. Breath of the Wild's soundtrack can get a lot of unnecessary flack from the community at large at times, and to an extent I can see why. The sounds can often feel empty, but that emptiness is purposeful. The fields at night can feel lonely when only a few keys of a piano can be heard, but that's because Link is, for the first time in a long time in the franchise, he is alone. He is scraping together memories. He has no partner at his beck and call. All of his friends died a hundred years ago with the calamity. Music only arises when it needs to, either in the form of the old world trying to make itself known again with the breaking notes of a piano, or in the sterile sounds of future tech in the shrines. The ideas and foundations of the series are always there, they've just changed to fit what has now become of Hyrule. There are way too many songs and even games to cover within the franchise. It would take a lifetime to examine them all in a way that garners the respect they deserve, but one thing remains persistent, whether it's the haunted melody of the ghosts that inhabit Ikana playing out in Stone Tower Temple, or the non-traditional instrumentation for an orchestral arrangement in Low Rule's overworld theme, there's a way for everyone to connect with the music found within The Legend of Zelda, and it will always hold a special place in the hearts of those who played it, tethered to them like the harp of a goddess, or a flute that can uncover the memories of the past. In fact, in the original Japanese version of the first NES game, what we know as the recorder item was called a flute or Shaku Ashi, I hope I said that right, I probably didn't, an instrument used in legends that recall things that happened before the player was born. What is most impactful about this isn't its mechanical use, but its musical motif. A quick three second melody that is charming, but more significantly is used as the main backing melody to the Ocarina of Time title screen theme. It could be a callback to old fans, but I like to see it as a subtle hint that the way music is used in the series is about to become 
much more significant. Instruments were significant in Zelda before this, but starting with Ocarina of Time, not only the way you progress and directly affect the world around you, but it's also how Link connects with his friends, old and new. This is what makes Twilight Princess feel that much more bittersweet. The stones Wolf Link learns, songs to howl at a hanging moon, are found on what look like tombstones, the graves of his old incarnations leaving behind their long-lasting connection to help him again whenever the need arises. Even in death, their songs persist. Each instrument Link plays or controls reflects his adventure. In The Wind Waker, he is conducting the Symphony of the Sea. The lost guardians who once held this land before the flood and passed those duties on to its new denizens. The harp, an instrument of angels in Greek mythology, is passed from Link's best friend Zelda before being sealed away only to return centuries later as the very instrument Sheik uses to help him traverse Hyrule once again. Link is a vessel for connection, one that retells new variations of a legend that started long before him, and music is the threads that tie them all together.